Hello and a very warm welcome to the Rethinking Cyber podcast with me, Rebecca McLaughlin Easton. We're delighted to return with this new series of insightful conversations with thought leaders and industry experts as we continue to raise awareness of the challenges and opportunities surrounding cyberspace. My special guest today is Her Excellency Kirsty Kalulade, who served as the fifth president of Estonia from 2016 until 2021. She is the first and only female head of state in her country's history, and her impact at home and abroad throughout her tenure was significant. Her Excellency is a champion for multilateralism and addressing inequality through technology. She's also a tireless global advocate for the health and well-being of women and children. I sat down with her on the sidelines of the Global Cybersecurity Forum in Riyadh, which this year had the theme of charting shared priorities in cyberspace. Your Excellency, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for talking to me today. Thanks for having me. Let me start by asking you about GCF. You've been speaking at the forum this week about what is shaping cyberspace and what role international cooperation plays in managing its evolving dynamics. One area of focus has been women. So how do you see the role of women in cyberspace? And do you think that cyberspace currently serves women well? Frankly speaking, uh, I always make clear that uh, I see the role of women exactly the same as the role of men in every walk of life. The only thing is that uh, because half of the population are women, then half of the good ideas by definition go into women's heads. So if you have less than an equal representation, you are missing out on something, probably also missing out on economic growth, missing out on security and safety, and also missing out educating your whole population about the cyber risks, for example. Can you expand upon this? How do we gain greater inclusion, but also tap into the talent pool? Yeah, two things. First, we have to make sure that new generations grow up uh, gender blind. And then we have to make sure that new sectors of economy are not contaminated by the biases of the old sectors of economy. I give you a simple example. Venture capital depends heavily on financial sector. And, uh, and venture capital in digital sector is still decided by the financial sector, which means that uh, lady founders have it far more difficult difficult to, uh, to find financing for their good ideas. Statistics shows it's really bad. And despite the tech sector, by definition, being greenfield, they are actually being contaminated by the biases of the financial sector. So we need to really break these kind of negative uh, negative connections and, and make sure that women can fry. And in Estonia, for example, our uh, digital sector, and we have a huge digital sector, which is hugely influential also, they have started a program for girls to make sure that uh, even those girls who from home have probably learned that girls don't do this and girls don't do that, they will be able to thrive uh, in tech and also in practical physics, uh, well, isolated from these biases of society. And uh, I now see that there are girls growing up, going to universities and then hitting the glass ceilings there. And uh, of course, not ready to accept this anymore. And, and I'm sure that this uh, kind of unicorn squad sisterhood will keep supporting them and it will be easier for them through the first years of career because you know when you first enter the job market and then you kind of meet this uh, either conscious or unconscious gender bias then it's very tough and they have each other to I mean make jokes about it to uh, maybe stand up to it but we all know that in the first years of your career you're rather put up with this and then thereafter you start speaking out about it. What will it take to really accelerate to, to catalyze the change? If you look at the statistics, then during the COVID pandemics, actually women's position in all societies from Sweden and Switzerland to Nigeria and all other countries globally got worse. It's just the difference is that if you lose from 90 percent, 10 percentage point, you are still left with 80 and some place you were left with nothing. That's the difference, of course. But indeed, statistically, actually, women's role and positions not growing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm afraid that, I mean, uh, we also have to take these hard numbers into account. Yes, I, I, I think that private sector and business really is changing and opening because precisely because they've realized that, I mean, there is uh, always lack of good, qualified, reliable workforce and women are wonderful, good quality, uh, reliable workforce, well-educated as well. Uh, but indeed, we globally, we are not doing so well. Yes, we have, to, uh, we have to now hope for spillovers from private sector back to the public sector, which probably in the first instance was uh, the leading part, if we think back to the UN role, for example. 
When we look at cyberspace and the challenges, but also the opportunities relating to our conversation about women, do you believe that it is gendered and that we can make a difference if we equalize the balance somewhat? Yes, the uh, the sign that we have arrived is when we stop so marveling about us being half somewhere or 20% or 30% somewhere, but we're not there. But of course, also this sector has um, this disease um, that uh, because of indeed uh, workforce is needed, then all kind of special needs, including being a woman, <laughs> are accepted. And high flyers can really fly high as well, but it's about the averages, whether the average opportunity to be promoted, whether the average salary in this sector is the same as for male and, and, and women participants. This is the important thing. And uh, I'm quite sure we are not there, but we need to keep being transparent about it. For example, salary transparency is extremely important that sectorially people should know what on average in this sector uh, they should earn. And, uh, and I see in Estonia, our labor organizations are really striving hard to make sure that this transparency exists. In a small community, of course, it is difficult because uh, we don't have masses of people working in the same job, but we're trying. And, and I think we have to be honest about it that uh, not, not one country in the world has quite achieved it. Mm, it's a work in progress for us Absolutely, all. Absolutely, it's a work in progress. As the first female head of state in your country's history, and also its youngest, you have a unique perspective on female leadership. Can I ask you to share that view with us? Yes, I've been all through my life uh, faced this kind of, uh, well, I would say backhanded compliment. Oh, you're first woman director of power plant. You are an advisor to prime minister on economic matters, and you are a young woman. I was 29 at that time. And I've always been pretty rude about these kind of comments, I have to say. Because if I don't point out that it's uh, unnecessary, then who? Then who exactly? And indeed, I'm always wondering what exactly should be then the difference between a man or a woman, which makes it so marvellous. And I mean, nobody has an answer, obviously. You make a very valid point. Let me rephrase the question. What is your view on leadership? What would your advice be to anyone looking to follow in your diplomatic and political footsteps? The leadership issue is twofold. One thing is, of course, I cannot, I mean, take, be, be proud of being a woman because I simply am a woman. I've never been a man. On the other hand, children in Estonian kindergartens for five years have been drawing president in a dress. So they don't have discussion whether a woman can be a president. They know, I mean, it, it can be. So this is one element. And the second element is that I do really sincerely believe that every woman who has reached the top has an obligation to speak out about how the way to the top was, what have been the sacrifices, what have been the kind of comic incidents of, uh, of uh, seeing gender bias. And, and it's, it's always nicer and easier to say, okay, okay, I understand. I mean, like I've stepped out of an elevator in European Commission, all the places you would think this is a kind of an equal workspace. And I was 34. And I was going, I was a member of the European Court of Auditors, which is an equal body to the European Commission. And I was going to the meeting between members of the court and members of the commission. And I step out of the elevator and I'm directed to the translator's box without any question. And then I didn't even pay notice at that point. I was in my own thoughts. And then I said, OK, yes, they said me translator's box is there. And I said, OK, fine. And continued. They stopped me and once more indicated translator's box is over there. And then I raised hell. And since then, I always raise hell because I want people to understand that never mind that in your mind, I looked like a translator. You cannot act on your instinct. It's daily. It's common. A lady who is a leader, of one of uh, UN bodies, she once came to me and said, it's good that you and, and the Icelandic prime minister and the Lithuanian president, that, that you all share these things on your career path. Because she said every time she gets out of a plane, people look behind her to find who is the boss here. And she says, even if I know it's gender bias, it kind of chips away at your confidence. So knowing that they do this to presidents as well is actually useful. It's deeply ingrained, it would seem, in society and yeah. cultures yeah. and even education. Yes. It, it is changing yes. as we agree. When do you think that we'll get to a level where it's not a topic for discussion? When um, really people do accept diversity in the true sense of the world, which is not the case I mean, uh, diversity, be it then women, men, I mean, different ethnicities, 
when I went to work in the European Union institution and after the unfortunate translator incident, I tried to find, I mean, how many different colored faces I find in my organization. I found two. I, I understand I may sound a little bit too complicated and pessimistic, but if we only prize ourselves for having reached, let's say, 20% of women in parliament sometimes, I mean, sorry, it's 20% in 21st century. The first prime minister in Europe came into office and was a woman in 1969, the year I was born, Golda May. <laughs> this is the difference. Your Excellency, talk to me about how Estonia is positioned on the global stage when it comes to cybersecurity. Well, if you imagine a government which only communicates with its people through service software online, then you can see how important cybersecurity is for Estonians. And, uh, and obviously, uh, we've been at it for more than 20 years now. So uh, our uh, national cybersecurity authority really knows what their obligation is, is to agree on a standard and then enforce this standard among those who are all the big service providers, be it public or private sector. And indeed, if you look at the numbers, then uh, we have annually between two and 3,000 serious attacks, serious in this sense that they are intense. But only one last year had any, uh, any impact. The year before, I think it was even zero, where people really realized that uh, something's going on. And uh, of course, this comes with a price tag. The budget of the uh, Cybersecurity Authority has risen fivefold in the last 10 years. And I think we have to rely more and more on each other and partners and allies uh, to do it together because it is expensive. On the other hand, I mean, every technology since X to AI has had a positive use and the risk. So we shouldn't shy away from technology. And in Estonia, we really aren't because we believe that our, our digital state together with cyber protection costs us about 1% of the GDP, but we believe we save 2% of the GDP. And it's heavily biased towards, you know, simple people and small business because, you know, big conglomerates, they know how to relate to the government, whichever format. SMEs, for them, having three clicks online, is vital. Similarly, women with children, for example, in the workspace, if you can apply for school space, uh, space or social services uh, when your children are asleep, because the government is always open, it helps a lot. So I believe that uh, this digital service offer together with strong cyber protection, this is a great equalizer for uh, our society. You seem to have good collaboration between the, the public and the private sector, as we've discussed. What about cross-border? How important is that? Extremely. I mean, digital by definition has no borders and the Estonian economy also has no borders because uh, it's, uh, it's an economy which will be five times smaller if there were no exports. So <laughs> absolutely crucial for us. And, uh, and indeed, uh, having now everybody more on the same page on understanding the risks uh, makes our life easier, definitely. There are plenty of risks, not least when we look ahead to next gen technology, the, the innovations that continue to rapidly advance AI. What concerns you the most? It concerns me that governments shy away from using technology because they are worried about the risks. And, and it's really worrisome because if citizens see that the government is the most obsolete thing in the space where they normally operate, because all people act and transact online nowadays, and they also realize that government doesn't understand the risks and doesn't give them the tools to fight the risks. For example, digital identity, which encrypts also all the communication between two identified parties, should be a common norm. It's a normal tool for people to be safe in the cyberspace, yet so few governments take it seriously, linking their own services and allowing the same uh, kind of platform uh, for the private uh, companies, which is weird, because if you think in analog world, no government would say, find your own passports. But in digital, I mean, in big European nations, even where you have national digital ID, everybody's still founding their own digital passports using nicknames, passwords, weird and varied identity. We should actually have everybody one passport online as well. It's a tool. Another good tool is transparency. I mean, you have to talk openly about the attacks we do in Estonia. And uh, it's sometimes it's against the nature of governments. They don't want to kind of have people in panic and so on. But how do people know that it's so vital to update your computer if they don't know that we face annually 3,000 cyber attacks? 
Are we slightly underestimating the public? Do we think that they will be spooked and scared by every piece of news that comes out about cyber attacks? And also, in particular, when it comes to protecting their children online, they must be informed so that they can protect them. It is true that uh, even if we don't see, as Winston Churchill once uh, has said, to understand how tricky democracy is, is to speak three minutes with an average voter. I think indeed we don't say it, but we, we risk to underestimate uh, our people and their capability to understand. Uh, in Estonia, you know, we were occupied only 30 years ago. And during the occupation, uh, I mean, Soviet Union never had any any flaws, any problems, even not handicapped people. So we knew that what state is telling is hiding everything. And when the occupation ended, then the biggest change for the better in one second was not economic development. It was the freedom to speak finally about the flaws which we have, because if you don't speak, you cannot mend we stand in a studio connected to GCF. You can hear the hubbub behind us. It's been wonderful to, to have you on the ground here. How have you enjoyed your time? Well, indeed, we had, I think, really good panel opening this, uh, this conference uh, and to set the tune about uh, technologies and how not to be afraid of technologies, but to be, I mean, wide op- eyes wide open, ready to embrace the opportunities, but also cover your backs for the risks. So this has been useful and also encouraging women in tech and in cyber to uh, to talk about us as equals. And it's been good also to see here that there are women happily smiling and nodding from the auditorium. And the top down instruction has been to make more space for women in this society. There is no shying away from that. It's very valuable for the women of, uh, of this country. And we've seen this also here in the cyberspace and, and cyber discussions. There is no lack of women. What has surprised you about GCF? Even a conversation that you've had on the ground, which has been particularly thought-provoking? It's been very um, intriguing, exactly. This push for more openness, this Uh, I mean, search for how to contribute on international scene, not to consume, but to contribute. And I believe it's kind of natural for every middle-sized and and not so big country to question themselves. Can we contribute? Can the rest of the world see that we are ready to contribute? And in a way, it's uh, strike me that there is parallel. I mean, this country is far bigger than is my country. But the main question, can we help the humankind, is, is here asked in the same way, like in my country. And it's deeply moving because being, I mean, overconfident is always the worst thing. I mean, the best thing is really to seek your place in the global global playground in cyber and elsewhere. Do it honestly, sincerely and respecting international law space. And, and this, uh, this seems to be what we are seeing here. And what a perfect note to end our conversation on. Thank you again for your time. Thank you and hopefully see you next time. And so it just remains for me to also thank you, our listeners, and to encourage you to download more episodes in the Rethinking Cyber podcast series from Spotify and Apple. We look forward to welcoming you next time on the ground at GCF 2024 in Riyadh. Until then, take care and goodbye.